So, we have been uh, looking at clock and data recovery circuits and associated components for a while. We saw how the VCO space noise behaves and so on. Uh, maybe I will uh, touch upon them again uh, once more later, but uh, I think we know how the VCO space noise behaves, how to calculate the noise in a clock and data recovery circuit and the different types of phase detectors and so on. Okay. Now, <coughs> all the calculations that we made uh, that we uh, showed here are uh, good for linear phase detectors. For bang bang phase detectors, the bang bang uh, detector uh, bang bang uh, CDR by itself has instability, right. So, it keeps oscillating back and forth around the desired phase. Now, uh, that is something that cannot be avoided and we saw that the larger the delay in the loop, the greater the variation. Okay. Now, this discrete behavior introduces some other weirdnesses, some of that is very theoretically sophisticated. So, we will not deal with them here, uh, we will just assume the average behavior and go on, okay. where it is really important I will point out. Now, today we will uh, switch tracks and uh, talk about some different components that occur in a uh, data transmission link. Okay. <coughs> this is uh, fairly routine stuff com compared to what we have been doing so far, but this is part of every high speed link. So, we need to know how to implement them. <coughs> as you know this uh, these high speed links are also known as surdis. This stands for serializer and this stands for deserializer. Okay. Now, what does that really mean? So, let us say we have sixteen input streams, okay, and all these are synchronized with respect to some clock, okay, of some period. T in. Now, or the output of the serializer would be of a period which is one sixteenth of each of these. Okay, and then you will have all these uh, ones in sequence: d naught, d one, d two, d fifteen, and again it starts from the next d naught. Okay, if I call this d naught, and this is another d naught, or maybe I'll call it d naught one and d naught two. This will be d naught one. Then it goes through all the streams. Essentially, uh, sixteen parallel streams have been converted to, uh, into a single serial stream. Obviously the data rate here is 16 times higher than that one. Okay. So, how would you implement this actually? What will you do to implement this? Yeah, essentially it is multiplexing and in this case uh, also usual architecture I mean in principle you can have serialization by any number, but the most frequent most frequently seen are integer powers of 2 right serialization by factor of 8, 16, 32 and so on and that is itself done in a tree like structure. So, you have d naught and d 1 that goes into a 2 is to 1 serializer multiplexer slash serializer and then d 2, d 3 these go into a 2 to 1 serializer and then these further go into a 2 to 1 serializer. Okay. Actually, I think to have the order here as d 0, d 1, d 2, d 3, this should be d naught and d 2, this should be d 1 and d 3, okay. because this gives you d naught, d 2, d naught, d 2 and so on. This gives you d 1, d 3, d 1, d 3 and finally, you will get d naught d 1, d 2, d 3, d 0, d 1, d 2, d 3. Okay. I 
is fine. So, I will just show the structure of a 2 to 1 multiplexer or serializer. A multiplexer does not have to do serialization. In this case, we are also looking at putting them uh, together such that the input data period is twice the output data period, right. So, we assume that we have at the input two data streams D naught. D naught and D 1 and a clock like this, which I assume will be like that. It can be the other way around also. It is basically some convention that you pick. In this case, D naught and D 1 have been generated at the uh, falling edge of clock n, right. And from this, we have to get a single output stream which is D01, D11, D02, D12, and so on, okay. So, what do you do? We know that somehow a uh, 2 is to 1 mux is involved, that is, it has some control and a 0 input and a 1 input. This I think you know that if S is 0, it lets this through, if S is 1, it lets the other one through, okay. And what else do we need? <coughs> Yeah. And okay. D one. Will this work? Is it okay? No, I mean in practice. Okay, I understand. Basically, you're saying that when uh, clock in is zero this goes through and when clock in is 1, that goes through, but you have to make allowance for the fact that uh, there could be some skew between this clock and that and so on. Okay. For instance, this uh, clock generates that, but this edge will not be exactly coincident with that. right? So, you do not want any glitches to be there in the output and so on. So, what do you need to, how will you fix that situation? You understand, I mean let us say this clock in was instead slightly skewed like that, okay. This part seems fine during this there is no transition in the input data, but this part will capture this also that is not good, right. So, what do you have to do to guarantee that? Uh, we are talking about high speed operations, right. So, these things become important. What can we do? I mean, so maybe you have to add something. What, what will you add? Huh? Latch. Which latch? Where? What's that? Okay. So I have a latch, and <coughs> what kind of latch is this? So what is the input? 
and what is the clock with the latch or a flip flop what is it that we want you understand the issue right basically when this control signal is high clearly uh, the one input should not be changing during that time similarly when this is low zero input should not be changing at that time and also during the transitions of this control input you had better not have any changes in okay one after another ah Okay, and then what will I do with the outputs? I'll multiplex the outputs. Correct. Let's see if this is correct. I also have to verify it. So, I mean, we have to check. Maybe the some polarities have to be flipped, but let's say this is D zero. Then the clock could be skewed in any way; it has to still robustly work, right? So, if this is uh, clock in, then. D zero prime would be like that. Okay. In fact, this is not quite correct. Uh, because of the clock to Q delay of the flip flop, D zero prime's transition will be slightly delayed from the clock edge. Okay. And this. So, this is triggered on the rising edge of clock in that is we feed D 0 to the rising edge of clock in and then uh, uh, this D 0 prime that we get it will be slightly delayed from the rising edge. So, this should go to which input why it is during the 0 of clock in that this is stable right. So, this should go to 0. So, this seems to be ok. Similarly, now we assume that the clock will clock this properly D 0 I mean like for instance, now during the falling edge D 1 prime will be something like that. Okay, and in fact, it will be delayed. Maybe again, I wrote it incorrectly. I am showing the inputs to be like this, but you can arrange the inputs themselves to be uh, generated in the appropriate way, right? One input along the rising edge, and the other one in the falling edge, and so on. Okay, so now this will be. stable during the high period of the clock okay and that goes to 1 okay so this will work within of course i mean i assume that clock in is appropriately arranged with respect to d0 and d1 if not you can delay it a little bit so that it does get arranged okay so this clock is at half the rate of the output that is if this is at uh, some f in this will be a data rate at 2 f in and this will be a clock at f in right. So, this is a serializer 
by a factor of 2. And you can put a whole bunch of these things together uh, forming a tree like structure to get a serialization by larger and larger factors. Okay. Now, this is of course, we are not talking about like uh, routine digital serialization. So, at the output we will have very high speed data, at the previous stage we will have half the rate and at the previous stage we will have one fourth and so on. At some point it becomes quite easy and then you can use synthesized logic. But after that, uh, let us say if the output rate is 10 gigabits per second. So, maybe a factor of 8 below that 1.25 gigabits per second, you can use standard digital logic and assume that everything works. But after that, you will have to do some manual circuit design. You may use standard cells or you may use uh, your own flip flops and so on, but you will have to also take care of all these delays that occur, parasitic delays, the layout has to be done nicely and symmetrically and so on. Okay. So, you put these uh, two to ones together. <coughs> like I said, uh, uh, and the rest of it is just, I mean, the assigning the signals is just a matter of uh, bookkeeping. So, with three stages, you will have. this is a 8 to 1 serializer and if these come in a sequence d 0, d 1, d 2, d 3, d 4, d 5, d 6, d 7. Okay. So, obviously, this is giving the alternate ones d 0, d 2, d 4, d 6 and this is d 1, d 2, d 3, d 7 and again Did I make a mistake here? D1, D3, D5, D7. And you can see this is D0, D4, D2, D6, D1. Okay. So, if you have a number of uh, streams, like uh, 8 streams, and they have to appear in a certain order in time in the output you have to arrange it in the appropriate order at the input. This can be very easily worked out, but I am just showing you this example. Is this okay? And let us say the output is at some f s okay. and typically you have a clock generator using a phase lock loop. We will come to phase lock loops later, which uh, generates a clock at f s. Okay. And then, <coughs> you have to divide that by 2, because this serializer, the output is at f s. So, the clock that is driving this is at f s by 2. Okay. Then, you have another divide by 2 clock driving the next stage will be at f s by 4 and another divide by 2. Divide by 2 I assume you know basically it is a d flip flop uh, which is fed back on itself which gives you the alternating transitions in every clock uh, cycle right. And this is at f s by 8. Okay. So, every deserializer has every service circuit has a, a PLL also. First of all, you need PLL for the providing the clock for the clock and data recovery and things like that, some reference clocks and so on. It is also required for this. So, typically, a service chip consists of uh, the receiver part which has the clock and data recovery circuit, probably a deserializer. Uh, sorry, probably an equalizer and a deserializer, and the transmitter circuit, which has a 
serializer and <coughs> there will be you have to drive the transmission line or whatever the channel is. So, so there will be some driver I will just call it the transmitter. So, that will be there ok and there will be a uh, clock generating unit because it has to generate a number of clocks at different frequencies ok. So, there will be a phase lock loop and a whole bunch of associated circuitry. Of course, when you make the serializer you will probably also leave have these divide by two stages laid out along with this because again we are talking at about very high speed circuits. So, ideally if uh, the F s clock is like this the textbook picture of a uh, divide by 2 says that the output edges will be coincident with let us say the rising edges, but in reality that will be a delay also again we are talking about very high speed circuits. So, there will be some delay here and some delay there and some delay there and this clock is what is probably used in the back end to generate all this in the first place ok. So, you will have to make sure that the clock delays the clock that is used to generate here all the delays that occur in the circuit are all arranged properly. So, that everything works ok. I would not say anything more specific than that, but you understand what I mean whenever you clock a flip flop you cannot have the clock very close to data transitions right. You need to leave room for setup time and hold time of the flip flop ok. Similarly, when you have a multiplexer you cannot have any input transitions when uh, that input is being directed to the output otherwise you will have glitches in the output ok. And there also uh, when the control is transitioning you would like the data to be stable ok. So, all those things have to be arranged and each of these things will have uh, some delays. So, in some cases it may actually help you, but uh, you will have to see which particular phase of the clock to use uh, to get the result that you want ok. So, those are all the things to be taken care of while making a DC realizer. The schematic is routine it is just a couple of flip flops and a multiplexer, but uh, uh, the timing and so on simply because you will be operating at high speeds that can become uh, little complicated. It also means that when you are doing layout you have to do things very carefully to avoid parasitics, avoid extra delays and things like that. Any also you want to if you have multiple paths which are nominally identical in layout they should also be geometrically identical as much as possible ok. So, this will be a part of every uh, circuit. Now, this transmit driver itself can be uh, a challenging circuit design depending on what it is driving right. It has to drive a certain amplitude reliably into a channel and it may also have to incorporate equalization and it should uh, do everything with uh, while consuming the smallest power consumption that is possible ok. So, that will come to later. We will for now assume that it is just like a buffer it takes this and then drives the transmission line or whatever channel you have ok. Now, this transmitter can be anything we are uh, most of my examples will be with uh, traces on a back plane. So, it is a electrical transmission line and then you drive some voltage roughly speaking it should look like 50 ohms although it will look somewhat uglier. Now, you could also have optical systems where this transmitter will be driving either a laser or a uh, or an optical modulator. Now, some of those things can be quite challenging also. So, you may need a very large voltage to drive an optical modulator and so on ok. So, 
we will probably not discuss like uh, specific circuits of optical modulator drivers, but uh, the usual PCB line drivers we will discuss it later ok. And like I said it may have to incorporate equalization, we have not talked about equalization yet, but we will discuss that ok. Any questions here? I mean conceptually this is not complicated at all ok. And we similarly we have the uh, counterpart which is deserialization. This is of course, if you have a single stream at f s, you may want n streams at f s by n. In other words, uh, the requirement typically is that uh, d 0, d 1 and so on. Okay. So, you have a serial uh, stream here and I will consider n to be 2 and as usual n is frequently a power of 2. Okay you want uh, two output streams which are aligned in time properly ok. So, the E 1 bits I mean this is for a 2 to 1 the E 1 bits come out here and the odd bits come out there. How would you do this one? As usual, you can assume that uh, this appears along with uh, associated clock. For instance, I mean this would be the output of a clock and data recovery circuit, right. So, it uh, gives you the data at a very high speed and then you will have to uh, deserialize it because the digital signal processing core always operates at a much lower speed, at a speed where digital circuits can be automatically synthesized ok. So, that is usually in the uh, at most a few hundred megahertz to uh, gigahertz or so ok. Uh, this automatic synthesis even in the most modern uh, processes it is not possible at many many gigahertz ok. Especially when you want to make large circuits. So, you can have parallel implementations uh, where the clock frequency is low, but then maybe a multiple uh, parallel units are uh, doing similar things effectively computing data at a effectively doing computations at a high speed, but the raw uh, speed of uh, each of the circuits is low few hundred megahertz and so on. So, typically you have uh, the reason for uh, <coughs> I think we have discussed that when you transmit from chip to chip especially the longer the channel the fewer uh, lines you want to have ok, because that consumes resources. So, that is why you pack as much uh, data as possible that means, you transmit data at a very high speed. When you come to the chip and when you want to process the data, so you will parallelize it again that uh, whatever was low speed is higher today than what it was when we had only let us say 0.13 micron CMOS, but it is still confined to few hundreds of megahertz for the sake of uh, power efficiency right, because uh, you have very large uh, digital signal processing stuff and you want to operate them efficiently. So, we assume that uh, we have the output of the CDR and we have to deserialize this. So, what should I do? Huh? Yeah, so what circuits do I, I mean this is let us say D in and this is C k. So, what should I do with this? D multiplexer? What is a demultiplexer? Okay, I mean, you want? Are you imagining something like this? Finally, it has to be something like this: one input, two output. So, what will the switches be controlled by? Of the clock rate. Yeah, that has to be done because so basically this is this clock 2 is at half the frequency of clock and the transitions of clock 2 are aligned with the rising edges of clock. 
and I will assume, assume that the rising edges of the clock are in the middle of this data symbol, so that it is suitable for clocking the data. Okay. So, this again I mean you have to look at how the clock is aligned to data in your particular implementation. In my case I have to draw it in particular way, so in every case I tend to draw it with data and a clock associated with it with the rising edge in the middle. Okay. So, when you put all the circuits together you have to see which way it goes, I mean that is again a trivial manipulation. So, in this case I have assumed that this uh, clock happens to be in the middle of this data. Okay. So, then what do I have to do? So, first of all if I have flip flops uh, clocked by the divided clock, it is clear that uh, this will give me alternate bits and this will give me the other alternate bits right obviously, but the problem is I think uh, again this uh, type of stuff we had in the Alexander phase detector also. So, this will look like this and this will look like that it is skewed by half a cycle. So, what I have to do? So, I will get d 0, d 1, d 2, d 3 like this whereas, when I have parallel streams I want all of them to be aligned to a particular clock. One more, where in the upper one or the lower one? Both, yeah. Actually, it is enough to do only in the upper one, right? Because this is now aligned to negative edges of clock 2. I will also align this to the negative edges of clock 2. Basically, I will delay this by half a cycle, that is all, okay. <coughs> Okay, uh, redraw that. So essentially, I'll have DQ and the same clock. I don't need a full flip flop because it's already coming out of a flip flop, so a latch is enough. Okay, and for the lower one, I just need a negative edge triggered flip flop. Okay, and this is D in, and you can recognize that basically this has three latches and this has two latches, right? And in this particular case, we will have the outputs to be aligned with each other D2 and then they are triggered by the falling edge of right c k 2. This is okay. So, this is a 2 to 1 d serializer and then you put a whole bunch of these things together to get deserialization by larger and larger factors. Okay. And here also you will need a similar structure, so you will have sorry I should not have called it 2 to 1, it is a 1 to 2 deserializer, a 1 input and a 2 output deserializer. Right?
as before you will need you will have the input clock you have to divide it by 2 and feed it here divide it further by 2 and feed it to these stages divide it further by 2 and feed it to those stages and so on okay And again, you can work out the order in which the bits come out. This divide by 2 counter, it is quite easy to make also. Of course, the D flip flop has to be operating at the appropriate speed. So, this you can see I mean at every rising edge of the clock basically q bar gets loaded to d. So, its state gets flipped. So, the output will be if the input is like this the output will be like that. So, the building blocks in a uh, serial data transmitter they are all kind of similar in that you have latch and once you make a good latch you can use it everywhere for making flip flops in the clock and data recovery circuit for making uh, dividers and so on. Okay. They are all like although the high speed circuits they are kind of all the, the same digital block is used everywhere. Okay. Now, I said that this is done so that of course, you can do digital uh, processing. Now, the other kinds of digital processing that may be done uh, there are of course, an infinite variety what you do with the data our business is only to transmit high speed data over a channel uh, which may be very challenging to transmit over. Okay. Now, one particular type of digital processing that is done is for the CDR itself that is we our CDR so far looks like this we have let us consider the bang bang phase detector which I said is what is more practical these days. And we have the up and down signals. this is our uh, CDR right. Now, of course, we also had a variant that is what we started off with where we have a forwarded clock. Okay. So, we have also a clock in, but we have a delay which is variable and here what do we have? What was the difference between this and the early one? Eh? Directly. Directly. Directly? I mean did we have all this stuff or VCO? No, no, this is with the forwarded clock. We have to change only the delay. Was this the circuit? Resistor is not there. Yeah. So, the resistor was there so that you can work with the VCO. There, the in case of the VCO, the capacitor had to be there so that you can change the free running frequency of the VCO. Here, again, when the average uh, current of the charge form becomes 0, the delay will be adjusted to the right volume. Okay. In either case, one of the problems is this capacitor. This tends to be large. Okay. Now, large capacitors are a problem. They occupy area on a chip 
that is one problem. And also, if you try to use like more area efficient capacitors, uh, like MOS capacitors, sometimes you can use them. The MOS, uh, uh, a MOS capacitor, MOS transistor that's on. It's a capacitor between the gate and drain or source, right? But uh, those those capacitors in particular have a lot of leakage current. Okay, a capacitor should not draw any DC at all, but it'll have leakage current. And even the other type of capacitor, of course, if you try to make very large capacitors. Uh, you will get a feel for the kind of uh, values you will see in this assignment. Uh, you will have a large area. Okay. Now, one of the things with these uh, clock and data recovery circuits and so on, of course, we are uh, conceptually discussing one channel, but on a single chip, you have lots of channels, right? Uh, for instance, especially with the forwarded clock, I said forwarded clock is used in particular where you have a large number of parallel channels and uh, you have <coughs> essentially. Uh, delay lines for each of them. For each lane, you have to do a uh, clock and data recovery, right? You have one common forwarded clock. In this case, it is particularly bad if you have to put a large capacitor for each channel, okay? If you have a single channel, it may be okay, but if you have capacitors beyond a few hundred picofarads, right? 100 picofarad is actually quite large, but if you have several hundred picofarads or higher, then the area becomes very expensive. You either have to use a, a, an external capacitor. This is generally not preferred uh, because you will have to use a pin that is also expensive in some ways, okay? And that is out of question anyway when you have multiple channels. You can't have so many pins for so many integrating capacitors in the CDR loop. Uh, so you want to avoid this, okay? So one way to uh, or one uh, thought is that this can be, I mean, this is kind of exclusive to the digital or bang bang uh, phase detector. You could do it with linear phase detector also, but basically what we want is just this clock, okay, whose phase can be changed, right? In principle, that is all that is there to it. The clock and data recovery circuit, somehow it is looking at the phase difference between D in and this clock and this clock's phase has to be changed, okay? The same in the other case also when you have forwarded clock. Now, <coughs> of course, we used a VCO because it generates a variable frequency and consequently also generates a variable phase but there is no need to use that. Meaning, so let us say, let us imagine another scenario where I have a number of phases available, okay? So, I have a 10 gigahertz clock and I have, I do not know, 32 phases of that available, right? Uh, the total span is 360 degrees and I have at spacing of 360 by 32, around 10 degree spacing, I have uh, uh, different clock phases available, okay? So, in principle, you know that if the data symbol is like this, Okay, and you have all these clocks available. One whose rising edge is here, the next one's rising edge is there, the next one may be there, and so on. Right? So then, in principle, you know that hey, somehow I have to pick one of these so that it works. Okay, this is also a clock recovery. Basically, I have a fixed set of phases available and I have to pick one of them and which one I pick may have to change also because depending on temperature, etc., the delays may change, some things it may change, okay? But you can see that this process is now digital, right? I am selecting, so I have clocks numbered 0 to let us say 15 and I am selecting one of them, okay? So, how would I do that? Yeah, exactly. So, that is one of the ways, I mean especially in this particular case, that is directly what he mentioned that. So, I have the control voltage for the delay line here, okay. So, now this uh, the delay between this and that is dependent on the control voltage, okay. Instead of uh, thinking of it as a delay, let us say I have like 16 uh, fixed phases available here, okay. So, then I will make the same relationship. Let us say uh, I call this C k and phi C k versus V c, it was <coughs> something like this, right? The delay was reducing with uh, V c, so phi c k will increase, meaning it starts becoming more and more leading, okay? Now, instead of this continuously varying phase, I have some number of phases available, okay? So, like you said, maybe I can just quantize V c and pick one of these, right? Now, this of course, in principle is okay, but it did not solve this uh, business of having the capacitor, right? 
you understand so what should i do first you understand the motivation the capacitor is too large i want to get rid of it for whatever reason or maybe we are entering the digital age i don't want an analog capacitor maybe that's the reason whatever it is uh, i want to get rid of it okay so <coughs> but there are good technical reasons for uh, doing that and now <coughs> the arrangement is that i have a fixed number of phases available how we'll generate those phases that is also a problem but that we can do let's say okay and i have to pick one of them so how do i do that so one way i mean in principle okay but uh, in practice not solving our problem is uh, this t or tau is after all is delaying uh, the input clock based on vc so based on vc i fix uh, i select one of the phases available to me okay so now i don't i want to get rid of the capacitor also what should i do comparator where at the output of what ha huh? now what is the what is the voltage across the capacitor so let me call this up and down what is the expression for the voltage across the capacitor it is icp by c times up minus down okay what integral of this with respect to t and this up minus down down are discrete uh, time signals right so either up is high for uh, one full period this is a bang bang phase detector okay up up minus down unlike in the uh, in the linear phase detector the integral of this up minus down can take continuous values because up will be da like high for some time and down will be high for some other time and that time can be continuously varying whereas here up is uh, high for one full period or down is high for one full period okay so if you integrate this from 0 to let's say some number of uh, input clock periods so this can be alternately alternatively represented by what accumulator basically right because this is a constant and up minus down is either uh, plus 1 minus 1 or 0 i mean 0 if there is no transition and this integral with respect to time is just that times ts that's all okay because i mean this is basically hap this happens because we have a digital phase detector bang bang i mean binary phase detector so this is summation from 0 to n icp by c which is some constant it doesn't matter what it is uh okay is this fine we get the same signal as uh we see on the capacitor except of course <coughs> now i integrated over a whole number of periods if i look in the middle of some period let's say if up is high the voltage will be increasing like this what i will get from this expression is only the end points but that is okay i mean that's not a problem right so finally uh, you understand what i'm saying so if up is high the vc vc will vary like that if down is high it will vary like that this expression is for integrating up to the end of some period so i'll be uh looking at either this value or that value and so on but that's okay so that's just an approximation to the continuous time integration that you know right so instead of uh, integrating the charge pump output current on a capacitor so we don't need any of this all we need is this is just a scaling factor we actually don't have a c here it's just a number right in fact this has dimensions of uh, <coughs> by the way i have to also multiply this by ts this has dimensions of voltage but this is again not necessary because we are going to quantize vc to pick one of the phases right so i will uh, uh, deal with this tomorrow so i'll have some other scaling factor inverse of the voltage there so that will go away completely you will have some dimensionless scaling factor 
basically what I have to do is I have to accumulate up minus down okay. and I probably have to quantize it because I have a finite number of uh, phases and based on the result I pick one of the phases that is all. Okay. Is this fine? So, at least in this case where we have a forwarded clock it is quite easy to see what is happening. Essentially, we were integrating up minus down to change the delay of the delay line. Instead, we can accumulate the number up minus down okay. and we have to choose the constant that is multiplying the accumulation properly okay. and then uh, based on the result of the accumulation we can pick one of the phases. right? So, if we get a continuous uh, sequence of ups, uh, up pulses this number will keep going up. So, maybe we will keep changing to the next phase and the next phase and the next phase and so on, but if we keep getting alternate ups and downs this number will not change. So, we will stay with one phase. Okay. Is this fine? So, <coughs> conceptually the same and it also works similarly because essentially the bandwidth of this whole loop is much smaller than the data rate. Okay. Even in practice even when you make the analog loop the bandwidth of the entire loop will be much smaller than the data rate that you are uh, using. In other words the, the even in this the control voltage in the analog loop changes slowly over many 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 periods of the input data. Okay. It is not as though in every input data you are significantly changing the phase of the clock. In fact, the CDR will not work very well if you choose parameters that way. Okay. Any questions here? So, now we can get rid of this essentially everything that is analog here right the current source and the capacitor and the analog I mean and the delay line like this also. We may have a delay line in some other form in the implementation, but we do not have this voltage control delay line analog voltage controlled delay line. Okay. Instead we will have to have a multi phase generator and we have to pick one of the phases based on this digital accumulation. So, this uh, turns out to generally result in more compact uh, realizations. So, that that is the motivation to go to digital implementation of clock and data recovery circuits. Okay. It will have its own problems we will see that.